Welcome to Future Talk, where we discuss the latest trends in technology and try to see where the new technology is leading us. Our topic today is generative artificial intelligence. The best known example of it is ChatGPT. Generative AI, though very new, is already having a major impact on society. Here to discuss it are my three guests. Greg Mikowski is head of Data Science Solutions at Cybernator, an AI startup. Narasimha Krishna Kumar is also a co-founder of Cybernator and serves as a strategic advisor there. And Yashish Shroff is an AI ecosystem product manager at Intel Corporation. So Greg, let me start with you. Uh, ChatGPT is the best known example of generative AI. Everybody's heard about it. What can you tell us that everybody does not know? Well, I can tell you some about what it can generate and how it works. I mean, generative AI is trained on data the size of the web. So very large data sets, not something people could easily reproduce. Um, it's, and that would just be the first stage. Then later on, they do something that's called an alignment. Alignment would be with human values or uh, human productivity. So examples of human productivity would be summarize this paragraph, answer a question, help explain something. Um, examples of alignment with uh, human uh, values would be don't be racist, no hate speech, you know, uh, be cooperative, things like that. And so then they take a second step after the base model is trained. The base model is just doing something really simple, like read a string of text, predict the next word. Do that over internet size of data. So that will we'll get something out, but it won't be as useful until you do the alignment step. Now, once you do the generative AI, it has a lot of concepts. When you talk to it, you interact with it, it's kind of like interacting certain concepts within the system. And from that, it can generate plausible text, plausible images, combining them together in a good way by all the past examples. It could generate things in English, French, or a programming language like Python. Um, if you're generating images, then it can generate images like this. Um, so, so, so you give us some kind of prompt. You say, draw me an image that contains certain elements and it will draw something that you would not have predicted or necessarily expected. Yeah, so for this image, I said generate abstract art that's an image of a person teaching many other people to train an AI. And so this is the person teaching, teaching many other people to train an AI. So it was abstract art. I didn't get into specifics of colors, balance, things like that. So uh, it thinks of a bunch of possibilities and just does some calculation to figure out you know, what to use. Well, it would look on many past examples of abstract art, and then some of the concepts, and then I'm kind of guiding it. The more things that you give for specifying, then it can kind of hone in on an example. I understand it can also do sound. Can you tell it to produce uh, a symphony in the style of Beethoven's Fifth, for example? Well, you can certainly uh, tell it to do something. Uh, do a, a sympathy uh, might be very complex, but one humorous example is to sing as if you're Barbie, talking about the Barbie movie in the style of Johnny Cash, uh, singing Folsom, uh, Folsom Prism Blues. <laughs> and that mm -hmm. was a pretty humorous example. But uh, you can also have something about a, a spaceship in uh, a watercolor style or some historic style of painting. Uh, so now you can have a lot of yeah. different contrasts. Now, how does this actually work? Like, if you give it the same prompt, will it always produce the same result? Well. Usually, not necessarily, but there's a, one of the parameters or a knobs you can do when you use it is called temperature. Temperature ranges from zero, meaning be very consistent, to one, uh, meaning you can be more chaotic or creative. Okay, and so, so by adjusting that, if you're trying to do something more business-like, like uh, customer support, you want to be very factual, you want to be very repeatable. If you're trying to develop a uh, a novel like a John Grisham novel or something like that, get some ideas on uh, what some practical cases might be in a legal case situation, uh, then it can make up some names that are plausible. A lot of the image generation would have a higher temperature, for example. Yeah. I think we have a couple of slides which illustrate this. Could we see that first slide, please? Yeah, so for this one, I asked the AI to generate an image of a fox in the woods. It's a morning with some fog. Beams of sunlight through the trees show up in the fog. And so you can see this is the image that was generated. Um, and then I looked at it, and I think, well, the fox looks lonely. Let's add a family. 
So then I typed in, and go to the second slide, add to the image some young foxes as part of the family. Now, I didn't specify how many was in the family, so it generated a large number, like nine or 10. Um, but uh, it, uh, now also notice that it's generating things, but it's not the exact same image. The light, sunlight's coming in from a different direction, and the trees are in different position. Can you move back one slide, please? And so now you can see the sunlight, and now go forward again. And so in the sunlight with the family, then the sunlight is slanting, coming down and to the right. So it has the same concepts. It's generating them in a plausible way. It's just a different configuration. So it's not so repeatable from one time to the next in the exact way. So if you're designing an AI, what are some of the factors that you have to take into consideration if you're designing an AI to do some specific type of thing? How do you build that? Well, if you're doing something like, say, a customer support app and you're designing that, you want to have it uh, do some analysis of like the sentiment of the person. If somebody's calling in, they're complaining about their portable computer. Do they have an angry sentiment? Um, are they uh, generally happy with their computer? Other things would be extract out what are the symptoms of the problem from uh, what the person tried. Maybe they tried some several different solutions. So if you can kind of extract that out from the text, then you can define that as part of the specification. And you do that in the prompt. A prompt would be get your starting position, because this is all kind of a time series. Uh, so your starting position, you could start off as talk like a five-year-old, talk in a professional manner, um, uh, talk like you're imitating um, some famous actor. So in this case, we'd want to start off talking like a, a professional customer support engineer. So it can pretty much mimic any kind of behavior you program it for? Well, it can get in the ballpark, and then you're working on refining it. So again, think of an AI as something like a new intern, new to a job. You give it direction, but think of it as an intern that can't ask you questions back if it's confused. And so, mm -hmm. so the way an intern that can't ask you questions, if you don't specify something, like the number of family members for the fox, then mm -hmm. you need to uh, go back and refine your question. And so really working with an AI is going to be like micromanaging a junior inter intern. It may help you be very more, very productive. So think of it as augmented human intelligence. You know, if you're a programmer, it can help you program a little faster by getting small pieces. If you're doing marketing, maybe it can help you do developing marketing material a little bit faster by getting different segments, choices you can choose from, and you can get some ideas faster. Now, but, where, now where is most of the demand coming from? What market segment is most popular as far as AI? Who's most in need of AI and demanding it the most? Any particular market segment? I, I would say there's an awful lot of market segments that are benefiting it. Right now, the current AI is heavily oriented towards text or images, so a lot of fields that are relating with that. Um, I think later on, Krishna will probably talk more about some of the, the marketing segments. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I would say that there's uh, just a, a lot of demand on where people can get their jobs complemented for the augmented human intelligence. Okay. And it seems like there are many applications of it as well. You can use sort of like electricity. Once it was discovered, there was no limit to the things it could be used <laughs> for. Yes, very much. So I think that people are discovering a lot of the creativity on what they could do with things. Mm -hmm. And so as people are developing and trying things out, we're finding out uh, what are a lot of the complex problems that couldn't be solved before that we can solve now. You, you can have it read all of Wikipedia and come up with some analysis. Mm -hmm. You can have it read uh, large books. One of the large uh, AIs is Anthropic, and they can have a um, read 75,000 words in, like that could be from a book or papers, and then you can start asking questions about that uh, to summarize sections or come out with key points. So they're starting to have very large inputs okay. in some of these systems that they can analyze. Now, Krishna, I understand that large language models are a very important part of chat GPT. Correct. Can you explain what exactly is a large language model? Yeah, so a large language model, you know, when you talk about models, these are typically algorithms. So a large language model is a deep learning algorithm which is best suited for performing natural language processing tasks. When we talk about natural language processing, you're interacting with the system, you're asking it a question, and it's giving you an answer. And typically, they have an input output, right? So you provide an input, they give you an output response, and then there is, from a technology perspective, they have an encoder and a decoder. And ChatGPT uses a transformer model. It's a type of neural network model 
we talked about a little bit about neural networks uh, before, but you know, neural networks are the foundation for artificial intelligence from a technology perspective. It mimics how the human brain works at a very high level, and you know, it's able to answer and reason with you and infer based on the training that has, it has had. Well, I understand that the large language model is mostly focused on processing text. Mm -hmm. Is it also applicable to pictures or sound? Is there a similar concept there? You can actually interweave images as well as sound. Like you ask Chad GPT a question about generating an art, and you tell it, generate me modern art. And it will look at what, mo what the data has been used to train it, and then it will come up with a creation. We looked at the Fox examples that Greg showed earlier, and that's one of the examples where you can ask Chad GPT to generate images as well as you can generate sound. You know, you have seen several videos that are there on the internet which have been, you know, produced by Chad GPT. You can add voice uh, to certain videos. You can do a lot of things. So the language model is foundational to the interaction with the system, but it can really use data that it has access to, like the internet is the whole data that it has access to. So it can generate those videos as well as sound uh, that you are requesting it to do. Now I understand that ChatGPT also has some limitations that we should be aware of. What are some of the limitations of ChatGPT? Yeah, so there are a few limitations I think that ChatGPT exposes us to. One is, you know, it can lack common sense, where you ask it a question and it can give you a wrong answer. It can also hallucinate, right? It's, um, you know, it can give you something that is totally created by it, but it's not factual. Uh, also, when you bombard it with multiple questions, it can lack the sense of prioritization. Which should I look at first? Which should I look at next? It can lack that. Also, it's not like interacting with a human being. It can lack empathy and emotional intelligence. So it can be rude at times, and you, know, you may not expect that. Uh, then it can also lack um, the, um, so it can also lack the uh, common sense from a, you know, answer perspective. It can give you inaccurate answers. Well, it doesn't understand anything, is that right? It doesn't yes. have any understanding whatsoever of yeah. what it's doing. It's just processing little pieces of language, little pieces right. of words according to statistics and stringing them together, but there's no knowledge whatsoever. Correct. It's the lack of context. So it, it doesn't lack the con it, it does lack the context of the conversation. So it, you know, it doesn't have, it cannot maintain the single thread context that we humans converse in. Also, it can, uh, you know, lack the ability to generate long form content. It can be very abstract and, you know, it can summarize, but it may not be able to generate long form content. So those are kind of some of the issues that you may have with chat GPT. I think there was a case where um, a lawyer was presenting a case in court, mm -hmm. and he presented something he got off ChatGP, and it didn't work out too well. What was that about? Yeah, so I think um, you know, uh, in that particular instance, uh, there was uh, references to certain cases that ChatGPT made up when there was not an actual case, and the uh, I think the judge uh, gave them a five thousand uh, dollars fine because of that. So it, it quoted something that was completely non-existent, and it's called hallucination, where you know you can ask it to write a novel, and it can get creative and write a novel. When you are looking at a legal case, you don't want it to create something that is not factual. And in this case, that's what happened. It hallucinated and produces co produced content, which really was not applicable to that case, and you know, it was deemed as factual by the lawyers. Well, does that mean that it gets all of this information from the internet but not everyone on, on the, never, not everything on the internet is accurate. And it might not have any way of distinguishing what's accurate and what's not accurate. It just say, oh, here's a piece of data. I'll just throw this into the mix. Yes, it can. It can definitely hallucinate. It's all based on the foundation, mm -hmm. you know, of the data that it has been used to train and how accurate it can really generate the output. So, you know, that's a area where there is an opportunity for the technology to get better. And you know, uh, many companies are working on that problem, on solving that problem. And presumably, it'll be refined. So, for example, if it's a little rude sometimes, presumably it's getting better all the time because mm -hmm. you want people to buy it. It's got to make them happy. Correct. Correct. Right? Yep. And it's okay. an iterative process, you know, where the refinement is happening, and it's all based on what the users are doing to consume the output and how they are using it. Now, another big issue is jobs. Some people have said that. Um, ChatGPT might take your job away. 
Uh, Hollywood writers recently went on strike, and one of their complaints was the fear that ChatGPT would put them out of work because it could produce material just as good as them at a fraction of the cost, much faster, never goes on strike. Uh, is that a realistic problem? A lot of jobs just going to go away like... Uh, I think it's going to make people efficient, more efficient. So, you know, it's good at generating content. Certain applications like, you know, if you want to do a marketing campaign and you ask ChatGPT to create content for your marketing campaign, it'll do it well. So, it makes the marketing manager's job easier and they can add value on top of what, you know, the foundation is. Then there is also uses in customer support applications where you can build a chatbot and you can ask uh, the chat GPT bot, chat GPT enabled bot, a question about you know, what the problem could be. And then it routes the call to the right representative that specializes in the problem that it has determined. So I think it's going to make our jobs easier. I think I was reading one of the surveys that uh, said that 30% efficiency can, can be gained in different industries. And that efficiency translates to freeing up hours for people that are in those roles. And you know, they are adding higher order value on top of chat GPT. So it's going to augment and make us more productive. Right. Maybe it'll create entire new industries, which maybe creates millions more jobs. Mm -hmm. But the change is taking place very rapidly. Like Correct. the Industrial Revolution took maybe a century or so. Mm -hmm. But this is happening in a matter of you know, maybe months. Is there a, a risk that we might experience some serious dislocation in the long term? Maybe there are more jobs, but in the short term? maybe a lot of people will no longer be needed. Yeah, we are, we are going to be in a state of adjustment where you know, the technology is going to rapidly evolve, uh, but we, we, don't, we haven't yet realized the full potential of the technology. So the possibilities are numerous, and we will find out. We'll find out soon. It can also make programmers more efficient. You can ask ChatGPT to generate code, and programmers are also becoming more efficient on account of that. So I think uh, the... Uh, higher order answer here is we are all going to become efficient. We are going to find out relatively soon as to what the disruptions are and dislocations are. I think it's more accretive to the economy as well as mm -hmm. the jobs that it would create. Okay, very good. Now, uh, so Yash, uh, people are used to interacting with AI through their computers or their phones, but I understand that there might be different ways of interacting with it. What are some of the other ways? Yeah, I mean, AI is you know, all pervasive in a way, you know, it doesn't have to be just, you know, sitting in your phone or your laptop. Um, you don't have to be on a browser. Um, it can actually manifest, you know, itself in, in devices that you don't really expect. And increasingly, there is an effort to basically uh, make AI kind of just be in the background. So one of the ways in which this can happen, and I think we have a slide for this, um, is uh, what recently came out, I think, uh, as, as recently as uh, a few days ago, is this uh, uh, pin. It's, uh, it's a little lapel pin. It's called Human AI. And uh, if you can flash. Yeah. Uh, I think we have a, um, a slide of that. Can we see that slide of that lapel pin, please? <coughs> yeah, there you go. Right. So if you um, see the top right side of uh, this uh, image, um, there is a person and uh, uh, she has this pin uh, that has a little magnetic battery on the back side. So it stays stuck on and it basically just, you know, listens to conversations. Uh, uh, and it, from a privacy perspective, they have, a, they have a, you know, light on whenever it's recording. But it will record videos, audios, it will listen to conversations. You can ask it questions, um, single tap, double tap. Uh, and can, can you it, talk to it? or Absolutely. You double tap on it, you talk to it, and you ask it a question. And in this particular case, you know, they're saying, you know, play me a particular song, right? And so what it does is it's playing a song, but it can also project what it's playing onto the palm of your hand. Or so, maybe a piece of paper if you put a piece of paper in front of it. Sure, but okay. really your hand is all you need, yeah. right? Okay. And so you can use gestures with your hand just just going like so, and it can go to the next song, next song or previous song or something else entirely. Mm -hmm. So you have this um, ability, you know, with uh, new ability with AI 
to work on what are called multimodal applications. What does that really mean? You know, it's audio, it's video, it's images. So it's not just text, you know, that you're basically mm -hmm. using to interact like with chat GPT. The world is rapidly changing um, to allow AI to, uh, the technology is rapidly changing that allows AI to basically work with uh, all sorts of sensory inputs that we as human are used to. So are we going to be totally immersed in it in the next few years? Like, you won't be able to get away from it. Chat GP will influence every area of your life. It, it may be so, but I think that while technology today is a little bit in your face, mm -hmm. or it's, it's a barrier between, I think, human conversations, I think it'll be a way for AI to be a little bit more in the background. And while, you know, um, the focus has really been in enhancing the capabilities of AI, I think in the next decade or so, we'll actually find a lot more effort um, will be placed in terms of putting AI behind us. When you turn on the light switch today, do you really think about electricity? You don't. You know, when you actually um, turn on your TV, you don't think about, well, you know, back in the day, you know, phosphor tube or whatever. You don't think about LEDs. You turn the TV on. You um, watch Netflix today. You don't think about, oh, internet and routers or anything else. And um, I think in, in this manner, uh, AI is going to be there. It will be there to help us when we need help, um, but it will be quietly away when we don't need it. And there will be you know, new user interfaces that will allow that. Now, is there such a thing as personal AI or personal chat, chat GPT Perhaps, where, absolutely. where you have a chat GPT made specifically for you for your specifications and your needs? Absolutely. And this was actually one of the more recent announcements that came in. But this concept generally is called um, AI agents. And um, the, the programming model for this is actually quite interesting where you have AI that, number one, doesn't hallucinate. It operates more or less a, in, a, in a functional way uh, with functional programming. And so it creates a small functional module that goes and does task A. Then it does task B, then task C. So what you have to do is tell it that, hey, I want something done. Buy me tickets you know, to go to Europe next summer. And it's going to go through a series of sequences to do this. Now, on the personalization side, it's very interesting because it can know your contacts, uh, contact information. It can read your texts. So the example that they um, gave very recently is, you know, ask the AI um, to uh, determine, you know, hey, hey, what was the gate code that I was sent, you know, by John? Um, and so as you're pulling up into the driveway, it'll simply answer that question for you. So it's something like a personal digital assistant, which we've had for years, but on a higher level of sophistication? Absolutely, because the more it's integrated into your digital life, it can start to pull in relevant information that will help you in your actual, you know, real life. And the ways in which this can happen, right, I just want to take a moment and talk about you know, privacy concerns or whatever else, right? But the way in which this can happen will essentially manifest itself in a way that um, we kind of treat our medical records today, right? Not everybody knows everything about you, and that's the way you like it. And so we want to make sure that while it can continue improving, it's not necessarily using your data to, um, uh, you know, do something nefarious uh, to you or to somebody else. Now, I understand that there are a lot of ways that AI can be misused. Absolutely. Uh, what, what are some yeah. of the things we need to guard against? So number one is uh, this concept of security. And so, for instance, um, today when you personalize AI, you are effectively giving it a corpus or body of knowledge. You know. So let's say you're a company and you have secret IP documents. And you want to be able to use that effectively within your own organization. But imagine that, you know, that agent or that knowledge gets leaked by way of the way that AI model is developed, right, um, into the real world. So that can become, you know, quite concerning. So 
there are there are significant you know efforts that are being made in terms of uh, creating a closed system that works out of what we call a Bayes model, a Bayes model that understands language and the broad internet that Greg and Krishna talked about earlier, but then is fine tuned on your local corpus. It may even sit on your own company's computers, but doesn't really necessarily go outside. And so there are steps you can take to mitigate that. Does it look like there will be many different kinds of AIs, many different companies competing with products? Or will it be like there will be hundreds of companies at first, and then most of them will disappear, and there will just be two or three big ones left? So it depends on who's doing what. I think that you will find a certain amount of consolidation in areas where um, it's expensive. For instance, we talked about Bayes models, these large language models. Well, it actually costs millions of dollars to come up with one of those. And the ability to actually gather high quality training data to build it, well, not everybody can do it. But when it comes to, let's say, you know, Yashir or Marty Yu, and you want to have something, you know, specific to yourself, then you have a limited amount of information, and that can actually be much easier to do. Um, and then in between, you know, you have small, small organizations that will also, uh, you know, have their own AI. So yes, in some sense, it'll be all pervasive. There'll be hundreds of startups, you know, that are going to offer services. And in some cases, there'll be a few foundational things that a few consolidated companies will do. Now, should we all be happy that AI is going to make our lives that much better? Or should we have a little bit of trepidation, like maybe some people will really use it for uh, ultra malevolent purposes. I think that danger is um, always ever present with any new technology. And as we go through, you know, some sort of hype around AI, we will realize that it can have some, you know, um, responsibility related issues. And mm -hmm. so there's a lot of conversation around it. There's a lot of optimism around it. It's an active area of uh, debate, you know, um, from major researchers and policymakers worldwide. But I'm optimistic about this because I think, at present, the benefits far outweigh um, the risks. Especially when you think about AI as being sort of like the great equalizer in the field of medicine for those who can't afford it, or education for those who can't afford it. You know, not just in the U.S. but you know, um, worldwide. It seems to be growing at an exponential rate. I think in five years from now we'll be seeing things that we can barely even imagine right now. You blink and you miss it. Yeah. So, yeah, it is moving fast. Okay. Well, maybe that's a good place to wrap up. So I'd like to thank all of you for coming today. Uh, thank you. Thank it you. was a very interesting conversation, and thank you for watching. We look forward to seeing you the next time. For Future Talk, I'm Marty Wasserman. We'll see you again.